and the 64 comes around, way around and is doing a gun run facing us. And he's shooting and some of them are hitting the compound and some are shooting over the compound. <laughs> and like a movie, they're coming right at us. And me and Bill jump different directions and it lands right in between us. And there's dirt flying from now from our own explosions from friendly fire. And I remember like getting up off the ground, like wiping the dirt off my face. And I'm like, this is awesome, this is what I signed up for. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we have round one of our two-part combat story with an elite member of the Tier 1 community, Brent Tucker completed over a dozen deployments with Special Forces and 1st Special Forces Operational Detachment Delta, more commonly referred to as Delta Force. Brent is now the founder of First Responders Coffee Company with the tagline Coffee with a Purpose because it directly supports the First Responder community and First Responder Cigar Company. In our first round interview, we cover Brent's unlikely path into the military to include bringing along his brother and somehow going from air defense artillery to Special Forces to Delta. In this episode, we also delve into Brent's first deployments with 20th Group, which sound very similar to a former guest many will recall, who went from 20th Group to Delta as well. The two served together. That's Bob Keller. Brent is what many of us expect when we think of the Delta operator, as his experience is downrange, book recommendations, friendships, and approach to life show. Please enjoy this wide-ranging discussion with a former elite operator, Brent Tucker. Brent, thanks so much for taking the time to come out here to California, uh, spend time with us and share not just your story, but also I'm, I'm really interested in the company story for FRCC. Yeah, it's just a short trip away. You know, just base of the neighbors there yeah. in Florida. Florida to California. <laughs> I was surprised to hear you hadn't really been out to California before. I mean, no. how, I don't know if you've ever counted, but with the units you've been in, how many countries have you been to? Oh, gosh. And I'm over, sure some over, we can't even say. But. Be, be over a dozen for, for sure. Um, the Now, I was going to say, and I didn't tell you this, because it, it does not count. I went to MTC once, which okay. is here in California, yeah. but that's not like really you know, big experience. Right, yeah, California. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I did get to go to that one time I, I told you about. Uh, um, spent a, a couple days in, um, in Beverly Hills, in Beverly which Hills. is also not necessarily <laughs> representative of all of California. Right, but and yeah. to see two thousand dollar tennis shoes on the on the strip was just disgusting. Uh, yeah, uh, um, so yeah. but it, it that's oh, in a weird way that's almost what I expected as well. Yeah. So it kind of lived up to the ridiculousness of what movies and and shows portray it to be yeah. this ultra high luxurious place, and it and it was. LA definitely is. Now, I did not belong there. No, <laughs> were, were you coming from Bragg at the time? No, I just retired. And I was I was coming from Florida. All right. Yeah. Either way, can be a stark contrast. Mm -hmm. um, look, I think one of the things, just as we were preparing for this, that has really struck me, you're one of three boys. Um, I also have three sons. I'm one of three boys. That's always been of interest to me, um, the, the relationship. I was hoping, as we kind of talk about your childhood, talking about right now, you work with one of your brothers yeah. and potentially in the future, one of the others. To me, that's like a dream if my kids could work together one day. Yeah. What's what's the relationship been like for you and your brothers now and growing up? Uh, we'll, start, we'll start with growing up. Uh, we're chronologically. It was uh, me and my older brother were good good friends. You know, from from the beginning. So if you ever watch a a family video of us, we're always in the background wrestling. I don't remember wrestling my brother that much, but apparently, according to family videos, all we did was wrestle in our underwear and him and him beat me up and make me say stop it stop it i'm serious it's in every video what's the age gap like, oh, no. uh, we're all three years apart okay so um so we were you know really good friends growing up you know we, we grew up kind of out in the woods in a, in a trailer uh not, not deep out in the woods but in a small town right off you know couple hundred meters off the main road with acres and acres of woods around us central florida central florida and um, so me and him were very close growing up. Um, the, my little brother, Lee, was always the baby of the family. 
And he was always, we always had a good relationship with him, but I don't feel like it was as close as me and, as me and my older brother, but it was a, a, a good relationship. Um, now when we got to like the middle school time frame, I got in this, uh, uh, this weird hip hop phase of, of my life you and a rebel and uh, wanted to fight, just be a punk. And uh, me and my brother were, were diametrically opposed to each other at that time. So Your that, younger brother. No, me and my older brother. brother. Yeah. Um, at that time, like, me and my younger brother never really had a bad, you know, a, a bad phase, but we never had, a, 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 in a childhood, a, a close phase uh, either. Um, but after middle school, um, I, uh, I got my wits about me again. Thankfully, thankfully it was a phase and uh, me and my brother became real close after that. Um, you know, we play sports, we go to parties, you know, and uh, you know, follow him around. My brother is a, a popular high school kid, weightlifting guy, football. Um, so generally speaking, a good, you know, dynamic um, with both my brothers. Now, as we got older, now 9-11 happened, um, my older brother, May have already. I have to ask him. He may have already started into the into the ministry um, at that point, uh, so he wasn't an option to to bring into the military with me because I, I wasn't brave enough to go by myself. Uh, but my little brother had had kind of fallen on his bad uh, phase of his life and gotten into drugs and running with the wrong crowd. And so when nine eleven happened, I actually drugged my little brother out of like like a, a meth house. When I showed up there, uh, the door is unlocked and I walked in, no one would answer their phone. I tried to turn on the lights, the lights didn't work because no one had paid the bills. It smelled like no one had showered in there for five days. And I waved my little brother, I'm like, hey, um, the country's been attacked and 3,000 Americans just died. I think I'm gonna join the military. Do you wanna, do you wanna join with me? And, uh, and like in a sleepy haze, he said yes. And so I took him at his word. Um, and we joined the military together. I also thought, as we're in basic training, my little brother's not going to make it. He already has a tough life of source of making bad decisions. And now I'm about to add a dishonorable discharge on top of it. And I started regretting it and really thinking, you know, for a while that like, and I, and I did this to him. Yeah, like your he, responsibility. He, right. He's not my responsibility. Um, so uh, I don't know if I've ever told him this. So I would work with him a lot, you know, on push-ups and tell him like he he um, he wasn't gonna pass basic training because he couldn't do enough push-ups, and, uh, and I'd harass him and do push-ups with him, like you know, because he you have to get through this. Uh, uh, but anyway, my little brother is now a sergeant major in the army. So cool. <laughs> Twenty years later, uh, so I I didn't uh, I didn't ruin his life like I like I was worried about. Wow. And me and him are close uh, now because we have that, you know, that that bond of the military together. Um, even though my older brother went to go be a youth pastor for the last twenty years, uh, he now works with me at uh, First Responder Coffee Company and and our sister company, First Responder Cigar Company. And he is my right hand man uh, in that company, and make sure and he makes sure that that it works. And when I'm gone doing podcasts like this, or if I go do a a, a random contract to try and invest back in the company. He's the one, you know, watching over everything while I'm gone and make sure things stay afloat and spends my money like, like it's his, um, you know, I mean, in a good way, in a good way, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, couldn't be any more trustworthy or a better person to be in business with. And, uh, and I hope we continue to grow. And my little brother's, even though he's a sergeant major, he's very tired of the, of the army and the antics of the army, uh, as you're very yep. well aware yeah. of. Yeah. Um, and he can't wait to get out and work with his brothers at yeah. RCC. So that's that's my dream as well. That's awesome. What branch did he end up going into? The younger, like he's a sergeant major in. Uh, our we both went to basic together, uh, and we were both assigned air defense together. So no we were way. we were we were the opposite of you. Um, yeah, yeah. We uh, we were fourteen Sierras is the MOS, which is Stinger missile, both Stinger missile like shoulder fire operated. And the Avenger system, mm -hmm. which is the uh, mounted um, version of the Stinger missiles, short range air defense. He's, he's still doing that. In fact, he's overseas right now because of uh, the Israel conflict. 
in a undisclosed location, you know, prepared to shoot down any missiles uh, coming coming into to that conflict to keep things only between two. Well, I was gonna say between two nations, but Israel's a nation, not a nation in a state. Yeah, I guess you gotta be careful on that. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, when you mentioned going into the military, you said you weren't brave enough <laughs> to go in on your own. I mean, it sounds surprising looking at your background. Oh, I'll surprise you more than that. Yeah. I didn't ride roller coasters as a kid because I was scared of roller coasters. My little brother would ride roller coasters and and, and call me names. And I'm like, I don't like roller coasters. And uh, we'd go to Wet n Wild, which is an Orlando like water theme yeah. park. Everyone would ride in Stuka, which is the big drop one. I'm like, no, I'm not riding that. That's scary. Um, I did not like scary things, which doesn't really seem like. I can't even believe this. Doesn't yeah. really seem like the uh, the, uh, the special the, forces <laughs> tier the one. Special forces bold, right? Yeah. And so when I was, I wasn't brave enough, you know, honestly, to you know, to to go at it uh, uh, on my own. And there's there was a lot of. Um, so I would have been 20, you know, at, at the time. And uh, I had just, in those past couple of years, as a, as a late teenager, I was a late bloomer. I was a small guy. I couldn't put on any muscle to save my life. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, scared of you know, dangerous things. Uh, I mean, I loved hunting and shooting guns and, and doing more normal things. But, yeah, I wasn't a thrill seeker. I did like, I'll tell you, when I got 16, I got into fast cars and, and I, and then when I was 18, I actually got a fast car. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was into fast cars at 16. I, I had an IROC Z Camaro oh, um, yeah. and then, then and I put a 383 stroker into it, um, you know, full exhaust, you know, uh, 373 gears, broke the transmission about three times. You know, we go to the quarter mile track and I really got into speed. Um, and wanted to go faster. When I was eight, then I was just a few. And after I did that, I got a '94 Z28. And I had an LT1 motor in it, put a supercharger on it. You know, back to the same thing. You know, throttle body, full exhaust, rear end. I just wanted to go fast, and that kind of that started my. I like going fast. I like I like adrenaline, but it wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't ready to jump out of airplanes. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, so wasn't brave enough to join with, uh, by, by myself. I brought my little brother in, um, but I really came into kind of myself as a man in a few short years and, and realized I, I went in that same time frame. also went from being a lazy worker that did the bare minimum, complained about everything and, you know, you know, looked to leave the family business as early as possible and not show up as few and possible as, you know, and, and to show up as, as least least amount as I could to being, Hey, like this is, you know, uh, just something switch. This is a family business. I'm, you know, this is, this is my future. Like, you know, how much, you know, can I be value added this thing? Can I, you know, and my dad even mentioned that, you know, that, that year I went from, um, somebody couldn't count on to whenever there's a project, you know, he kept on giving me projects to see how much he, he could count on. Huh. This is 18. Yeah, it's about 18. This is when this started. But I didn't join until 20. Yeah. So I'm going through this, you know. Does something happen when you're 18 like that caused this switch? No, I, I just I just think people, well, well, yes and no. One, I think people just grow up, uh, grow up in different times. Yeah. Uh, and some people don't get, you know, don't, that switch never goes off. Some goes off in their 30s. Like, you know, I've been partying my, my 20s my whole time. Maybe it's time to grow up. Um, but the end of the day, I really credit that to uh, to parents who never lost hope in me and just pushed me yeah. and pushed me and pushed me out of love and sometimes not didn't feel like love but you know tough, okay. love. <laughs> tough love and parents who just never gave up on me and then eventually I was like you know what maybe they're right maybe I should just maybe I should just work harder and grow up uh, and just you know that's so that that's the other side of that. Yeah. And clearly, obviously, we got the first responders coffee here. Um, you mentioned the family business. I do think it's important. You're running a business now from scratch, but you grew up around it. So could you give a little context? And is there any military background 
on in the family. Now, I didn't think there was, because really when you think about your family, you only know your grandfather, uh, your you know, a few cousins and 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 uh and, and, and your uncles. But my grandfather was huge into our family lineage and he did a whole family tree and went all the way back to to England and, and how far, you know, we were at Jamestown and came over on, you know, on one of the very first ships that came over. He was heavy into, into our family history. But he'd show you a whole bunch of people in my family history that did serve. I didn't know any of them, you know. I, I didn't know my great uncle's second removed yeah. on my aunt's side. Like, he'd show me all these pictures. Like, yeah, services in our family, but not not that I knew of, mm -hmm. you know, not, not, uh, Nothing tangible yeah. to me. Um, but growing up in a family business and, and eventually realizing how special a family business is, um, it really, it drove me when I, when I got in the military. Uh, I worked some, I did some contracting jobs. I did a few things, but really being an entrepreneur was always at my heart. I always wanted to start something um, that uh, I didn't have to, some of it's selfish, but I didn't have to answer to anyone else. Um, uh, I'm not saying I'm the smartest man in the room. I never am, but there's a lot of bad bosses out there, and I just got I don't want to work for any of them. Um, so part of that, and the other one is leaving a legacy to my you know to my kids. I have three mm -hmm. girls and, and a little boy, and I don't I want my little girl to ever work for anyone else but her but her dad if, if I can help it. <laughs> so that's. And, and the family business was a feed store. It was, yeah. And, and some other things, it sounds like. Yeah, Tucker's Farm and Garden Center. Um, he also um, was a part owner in a construction company, PRT Construction, which mainly did roofing. Um, I unfortunately got a little bit of taste of roofing in Florida as a, as a part-time job. And of course, and my dad did a great job of never letting me be the, the, the owner's son. I was, I was the lowest guy on any job site I ever showed up on. And I started out at the feed store sweeping floors and, you know, I, I never got an ounce of yeah. bit of, of, I got no benefit. I got no benefit from being the owner's son. Um, so I would show up early at the job site and scrape all the shingles off and then uh, just clean up uh, the talented men who could actually do things on a construction site. My job was to uh, clean up after them all day long and get whatever it is they wanted or carry all the shingles to the top of the roof wall so they wouldn't have to do that so they could continue putting doing the work. Doing yeah. the work. It was also really cool as a, as a young man to get a taste of that type of masculinity, if, if, yeah. if you want to say. That's like real work. It, it's it, real work. Oh, and it was, a, it, was, it was a crazy world because... In some aspects, I would show up to the job site consistently because I was told to. They may not, um, but but when they showed up, they were you know they worked me into the ground. But they may not show up the next day. Yeah. And they, of course, they, yeah, they'd have all these crude jokes and uh, just things as a as a fifteen year old you know young man wasn't always exposed to, and uh, it was it was quite the experience. Do you? Uh, I'm curious. Do you think? Because I love the sound of a kid growing up that way. Mm -hmm. Like, get no favoritism. Yeah. You start at the bottom, you work your way up. As you own a company now, can you imagine, like, your kids and having them go clean a bathroom? That's, I'm, I'm the owner and I still clean the bathrooms and I still take out the trash. Um, well, I know you do. But right. can, well, can you just, see your kids right. doing it? So, to say that, yeah. absolutely. Because I still do. And, uh, and it's funny, I, I, I try to instill this into my, um, and then my nine year old boy, but you know, I, I let him know early. I'm saying, hey, you know, son, you know, like one day you're gonna, do you know why daddy's doing this? And you know, one day it's for you and you're gonna take this over. He's like, yeah. I said, what do you, what do you think your first job's gonna be when you get there? And I don't know what he said. It was like something ridiculous. Social media? <laughs> <YouTuber>. <laughs> right, yeah. I was like, no, probably your first job's gonna be sweeping the floors. And then your second job will be just filling bags with coffee and then maybe running the grinder and maybe running the K cup machine. Nice. And I said, but, you know, you have to learn to do every job from cleaning to filling bags, to running that machine, to running that machine, to filling orders. You'll do every job before, way before you're ever anything important in this company because they won't respect you unless, you've, unless you do it. Like, they're going to respect me 
because I started the company and I've run all those machines and I still help run those yeah. machines out of necessity. Uh, but you know, I'll have the respect because I've done this job before. And so you'll have to do it to, to earn their respect and, uh, and to understand what it's like to lead them because you can't lead them unless you've, you've done their job. So I've started that, that conversation with him at nine. I have no idea if he understands it, but I will revisit it. Right. We'll you revisit it uh, slowly. Occasionally. Seep, seep it in. <laughs> Jeez. Um, would you see the same for your daughters? I guess. Abs- absolutely. Um, my, my daughters will. Oh gosh, I say that. Maybe. Because I don't. Maybe. I don't think I'd be able to do it. Yeah. And, and if people people think you know, there's. That there's not a double standard in this world, there one hundred percent is a double standard in this world, and whether they want to acknowledge it or not, it's usually out of the it's to the benefit of of women. Um, there is no gender pay gap. I don't care what you say, what you think, which, which you know, I'll look at y'all and I'll and I'll send me a message. I'll defend it. We'll go on this rant just real quick. You know, and, you know, talk about the gender pay gap. Women doctors make less than men doctors. That's absolutely true. But if you look one level down, that's because most women go into uh, family medicine. Uh, family and family medicine doctors don't make as much as, let's say, specialty doctors like heart, heart doctors, hand, hand surgeons, brain surgeons, things like that. So as a doctor level as a whole, men make more. But family practice doctors that are women make the same amount as family practice doctors that are men. It's just, it's one of the biggest lies we've accepted as a family, uh, oh, as a, as a, uh, as a society. So my girls will get, won't get treated like my boy. They'll get special treatment because they're girls and I don't, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be as hard on them. I don't get me wrong, I'm hard on my girls. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, I'm not certain that other other men in this world are raising, yeah, you are, are raising you men. You need them to be ready. That's right. So, yeah. so I'm preparing them to meet, I'll just say, a weak man, and they may have to raise, you know, that and do that job for, you know, for whoever's, you know, father did, didn't raise him right. Yeah. So they have to know how to do it. They have to know what right looks like. But yeah, I don't, my daughters will probably have it. Does that idea of of making sure that someone's run all the machines, right? Like they they know what it's like before they're leading someone else. Does that come from what you saw your dad do, or from your time in? Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, uh, I, I definitely Delta. saw it from my dad. My dad started that. You know, he he started, um, you know, from, from the bottom and 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 uh, ran every aspect of that business before he owned it. And his grandfather, you know, my grandfather, his dad started it. And he told me the same thing I told my son, which is you're gonna sweep floors, because that's, because that's, and, and he didn't say these exact words, but that's all you're worth right now. <laughs> you know, that's, you know uh, but I really, it didn't take as much hold as, as, as it, uh, even though it's, it's the same lesson as the military, watching leaders, who couldn't do the job, but somehow, you know, did the right things to get promoted. And now here they are telling people beneath them how to do a job that they couldn't do. And I, and that's more than, than I could stomach as a, uh, as, as a younger military man, even, and then a green brand Hills force guy. So that, that type of, you, you have to, you have to do it, prove you can do it before you can, before you can be able Just to. Just reinforces that lesson that you learned earlier. Really Just a quick thanks to our sponsor, Factor, and we'll get right back to this combat story. During the busy holiday season, or just after you run out of your holiday leftovers, you'll likely be looking for nutritious, flavorful meals to fuel you on your busy days, just like me. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, can help you eat well for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door, and you'll save time and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Factor meals are incredibly easy to prepare. For me, I just throw them in the microwave and you've got a ready to eat meal in two minutes with no prep, no mess. Think of it like a healthy and actually great tasting MRE. They've got options 
like loaded bacon and spinach, shredded chicken, smoky barbecue chicken breast, sun-dried tomato chicken, and many more. If you're trying to be careful about what you eat and when, Factor is a great option because you can choose meals designed for your specific needs like keto, low calorie, high protein, vegetarian, and more. So you don't have to worry about buying all the specific ingredients and making every single meal. Head to factormeals.com slash combat story 50, that's five zero, and use the code combat story five zero to get 50% off. That's code combat story five zero at factormeals.com slash combat story five zero to get 50% off. And now back to this combat story. How about when you and your brother decide to join, or when you decide to join and bring your brother along? <laughs> and drag what's, him. what's the discussion with your with your dad and your folks? <laughs> what? Um, you can... uh, they were sad to see me go, and they were happy that my little brother was doing something with his life. That that's a little bit of a tongue in cheek answer, it. but it's but it's also not necessarily inaccurate, uh, inaccurate at the same time. My little brother was 17, so he had to get, he had, my parents had to sign for him uh, to mm -hmm. join, okay. for starters. Um, and my mom, my mom's a very caring, loving person. My, growing up, my dad's been a hard ass. Uh, he's, he's more of a teddy bear as, as he's grown older, but uh, as, as, a, as a kid, you know, when dad came home at 8, because he's been at work since 6 a.m., you just stay out of his way. Like, you, don't and, and and pray mom doesn't say anything bad to dad about what you did while he was gone. Yeah. So he was not to be messed with. Um, but my so but my mom was very, very loving. And I've, but she's also a hard woman at the same time, like very um very responsible, very independent, you know, she because my dad was always gone. She had she had to be able to do it, do things around the house. So one of the few, few times I saw my mom cry was the day she put me and my little brother on a bus to basic training. I still remember that. Oh, I'm sure. I don't know if I've seen her cry since then. And that was 20 years ago. It's good you haven't made her cry since then. <laughs> That's good. good to hear. <laughs> yeah. It's a good song. Yeah. Not, not, not that she's let me see you. No. What was the rationale behind going uh, ADA? That's what the recruiter told me to do. <laughs> Let's hear this recruiter story. There's always a good one. <laughs> well, it's, I had, I had no, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And, you know, the military is very much like the rest of, you know, of, of people's build, of people's choices that they have to make, which is you have the most, you have the hardest decision that may affect you the most for the next 20 years. And you know, the least amount making this decision when you have to make it, which is true with, you know, going into college, right? Like you, you want to be a lawyer. You know the least amount of being a lawyer when you decide at 18 yeah. you want to be a lawyer and they're like what type of lawyer do you want to be you don't have any information really to answer that so like tv shows which is probably bad you right know, that's your actual so military is no different in that aspect i had no idea what i wanted to do um and uh so i i showed up and he and he's like what do you want to do i was like well, whatever the army needs he's like well let me tell you what the army needs air defense i said well that's what i'm here to do which is super ironic because I signed up for the war on terrorism and to do something tangible because we were attacked and 3,000 innocent Americans died. And the Taliban weren't exactly attacking us with their attack helicopters in Afghanistan no. or their fast movers. No. Um, so I got put in a job, which was the exact opposite of what I wanted to do, but I didn't have enough knowledge at the time to know that and to say, this is what I want to do. This is yeah. what I don't want to do. I, I didn't know that. Luckily, we it would have been much harder to reclassify as an MOS if I wanted to just do a different random job in the, in the military. Luckily, Special Forces is one of those jobs that are, are open to everyone. And because it's looked up as a as a career progression, you can't keep people, you can't keep someone from doing yeah. it. So uh, luckily, yeah, I, it wasn't a, a decision that really hurt me in, mm -hmm. in the long run. Now, it didn't exactly prepare me for uh, for a, a life. And not, special forces isn't isn't full. It's not exactly a feeder system yeah. to, to to be a Green Beret. Uh, so it didn't do me a whole lot of favors in that aspect. But uh, but hey, it 
you know, did something right. I became a Green Beret, so I, I got, wouldn't, so I wouldn't change it. I got to imagine that recruiter was probably pretty happy when he got the two for one <laughs> into the ADA pipeline. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah, got a two for. Um, gosh, I'm thinking his name here in a second. He was a nice guy. He was, was a it? super yeah. nice guy. Um, he, he he kept in touch with us. Um, but yeah, it, I don't feel like I was duped by yeah. you know by by the recruiter that uh, some people have that have that feeling or, or story from. I I it was my fault. I didn't know enough when when I went in and and I will challenge people to this even in 98 yes we had the internet 98 it wasn't like it is today no one has an excuse to join the military and not know what it is yeah. they want to do and I get questions all the time about the military and I get it like if you did a bunch of research first and now you want the ground truth I'll answer your questions all day long but when you just want the easy answer cuz you did no research you know on your own and and yeah, you want to ask no me thanks. questions I mean, I'm not a dick. I still answer it, yeah. but my, my but my inside voice is like he didn't even no. look. He didn't even Google this. What? How long is it before you decide you want to go that SF route? So I go to so I go to basic. Yeah. I go to AIT. Uh, I'm the distinguished honor grad of of my AIT. Uh, is that surprising to you at the time? No. Uh, that that like that switch had kind of had had, 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 had kind of hit. I just hadn't had anything in my life to pr- yeah you know to prove it. You know, so there's no really you know we're gonna feed so there's no employee of the month. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, uh, but I actually got a it, that switch had been there. I just now um, had a chance to prove it, and and kind of what I mean by that is it goes back to basic. You know when you know they was like hey. You have to meet. These are the minimums. You know, my recruiter telling me this is the minimums of a of the PT test that you have to be able to bait to get out of basic. And I was like, "All right, what's is there a maximum?" And he's like, "Well, yeah, you can. Like, there is a per. You know, there's a perfect score." And then you know, I left it at that. I remember going, "Okay, and and what is it?" And he's like, "Uh, I'll have to look it up." So the recruiter could tell you all the minimum the scores you could, but he couldn't tell you uh, in your age group what uh, a 300 PT, because no one's, you should say no one, I'm sure hopefully, hopefully someone yeah. else did, but he doesn't get asked that question enough to know the answer. Um, so I never knew what the minimums was. I didn't care what the minimums were. I wanted to go in and I wanted to score a 300. Um, and then, and but that was, that wasn't special to me. Like that was just, that was what my dad had always had always taught me. You know, when I give you a job, I don't want you to do what's the minimum I can do to get done with this job and move on to the next. Yeah. Take pride in this. You know, this is our family business. This is you doing that job. There's other, you know, we had eight, nine employees. They're going to look at you as the owner's son as the standard of, of, of what a job can be done. And if you do a crappy job, they're just going to do as good as a job as you do. Yeah. So he's, you know, some of those like family business, old school conservative values, you know, set me up for, you know, success in the military. So, you know, I went to basic, you know, scored a 300 on my PT. I don't know if I ever didn't score a 300 on my PT test in 20 years. Um, the, uh, went to AIT, became distinguished undergrad. Wasn't surprised to me. Um, like that was, that was what I wanted to do. Um, I get to my first unit, some guys had just come back from Afghanistan and I couldn't, you know, and war was exactly what I signed up to do. Yeah. So I couldn't wait to talk to those guys like me. How, how was war? Like, how was it? Were you in Afghanistan? Yeah, oh yeah. We're in Afghanistan. What'd you do? He's like, and they're like, and he kind of paraphrased, like settle down. We're in air defense. Like, we didn't, we didn't do anything, Brent. Yeah. Like, he's like, we didn't do anything. Like, do you, do you know what, when you don't have a job in Afghanistan, you know what your job is now? Because air defense does not have a job, short range for sure. And I was like, no. He was like, you guard gates, Brent. That's what Base we did. Defense. Yeah. For for twelve months, I sat at a gate. It sucked, and I'm telling you, it rocked my world. Yeah. Now, and the realization of what I'd really signed up for just hit me. You know, distinguished undergrad, three hundred PT test, stud coming in here. You know, now I'm at a unit. I'm ready to deploy. And it hit, it was like a punch in the gut. I did not sign up to guard gates in Afghanistan. Um, so I asked them, I said, well, well, did you, did you do any fighting? And they're like, no, like maybe the other side of Bagram got mortared, but if it, if we didn't hear it, 
And I'm like, and I'll just, every answer is just more disappointing than the last. <laughs> and I'm like, well, if you're not fighting, who is? And, uh, and they're like, and you can see and their face, their face expression changed and everything. Like, oh man, let me tell you about, we had these green berets that would come in the base. No, maybe there's some truth to it, you know, but you know, I'm sure the story got yeah. bigger in, in their mind. And like, they'd show up with like blood and guts all over the vehicles. And, you know, we'd have to. It was our job to make sure someone had a military ID before we opened up the gate. Like, well, military ID, Sergeant. And be like, F you, open the gate. My beard's my military ID. And 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 we and we um, we'd let him in. I was like, you'd let him in without a military ID? He's like, Well, you are you not going to? They're special forces, Brent. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, you're right. And then just that that whole thing just painted this picture yeah. for me uh, in a weird way. Um, I hope you think I'm a nice guy, but yeah, but I, I was always a nice kid, you know, a, a nice person, but that, that arrogance of I'm, you know, I'm better than you. Yeah. I'm willing to prove it. You know, you're not on my level. Um, like that still like, like drew, yeah, you know, drew me in. And I was like, man, I want to be one of those a-holes that, uh, that doesn't give you my, my ID because <laughs> And I'll say it like, at the end of the day, you feel like you do. And you know, in the military, there's so much average in the military. And just because you can out PT everyone and you can out score everyone and, you know, and, and AIT, there's really no benefit from it. Like you, you get no, no. There's, there's no encouragement really to do better than anyone else. There's a lot of, there's a lot of benefit to be a brown noser, but not a performer. Like in, in a, in a weird way. I'm not saying that's not, that's not true. 100% of the time, there's a lot of truth to that statement. Um, but being able to go to special forces and actually separate you from performance from the rest of the military seemed like reward for hard work and reward for, for, you know, being smarter than people. Yeah. And that sounds a little bit, um, maybe not the way I want to say it, but, that's what I'm saying. Well, just the population size. I mean, naturally, they, you know, it thins out as you get to these other units because of the demanding right. process to get in. Yeah. Do so, you consider bringing your brother with you? We talked about it a, a few times. Now, at, at that time, he didn't seem interested at all. And um, and I I was just glad he was, we're, you know, we're still in our first couple of years of military yeah. service. And so I'm just glad he hasn't been discharged due to drug use yet. So- um, yeah, I'll just take my wins. Yeah, just happy. I'll just take my wins. But there was a few years later after that, that, you know, my brother, um, I think he got reassigned over to somewhere in the 101st to be air defense. And, uh, he was, uh, considering a career change and he was either going to be a pilot or special forces were like the two things he wanted to do. But, uh, he ended up not doing either one of those and, just becoming a lowly sergeant major. Yeah, sounds like it worked out. I mean, he's a sergeant <laughs> right. major. Jeez. Um, so, do you end up deploying with an ADA unit? We almost did. Uh, the invasion of Iraq, they spun us up. And I was actually trying to go to selection at, at that point. And uh, we had called to go to the invasion of Iraq. And they're like, no, um, you can't. You can't go. Can't lose you. You can't lose you. You're, you're part of our numbers. We're going to Iraq. At that point, although I already was afraid of our our measly job in, in Iraq would be, but I was also excited about going yeah. to war. You know, still it's still it's still a deployment, and I was like, well, I'll train up there and I'll I'll go to selection. Yeah, you know, after this deployment, and this was before the invasion, so like this was like we were supposed to be one of the attachments to help out during the invasion, and then I watched the invasion happen on TV while being in El Paso, Texas. And I was like, well, I guess they didn't need us for the invasion. <laughs> uh, and I uh, can't believe they left without us. <laughs> How could they? Have How did you leave without air defense? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we, uh, we went uh, off of whatever deployable status at some point. And I'm telling you, like the day we came off that deployable status and they finally, they finally broke the news to us that you guys can just stand down. We don't, we don't need you at all. Um, I, I try, I tried to get a selection as fast as humanly possible after that. And it was quick. Like you actually got into that pipeline. Right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And <laughs> I'll tell you kind of funny story about that is 
even though we were told we're not going, they're like, hey, we're still technically deployable because we have all these certifications uh, for 12 months. Like we, they believe yeah. like this isn't like you would know that later, you know, 2016, like 10 years of deployment. Yeah. You know, well, more than that. But they were they believe they would still be deployable for 12 months based off of their certifications. So they wanted to keep everyone together for 12 months in case they got a call. They they, they we could just go. Um, and so I was like, no, nah, I'm going to special forces. And they're like, no, you're not, Brent. They're like we've sent guys to special forces selection. They all come back. Um, special forces doesn't want anyone from air defense, including you get off your high horse, wow. be happy with where you're at. Cause this is where you're at air defense. I mean, I'm paraphrasing it, wow. but that it's was like, we're that, not good enough for that. That was the message that 100% oh. was the message. And I wasn't hearing it. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to selection and you can't stop me. And I'm like, yeah, we can. And you're not going to selection. Get over it. I ended up having to get a, uh, a Sergeant major from the special forces recruiting office to call them and be like, hey, stop stop giving you know specialist Tucker a hard time. You can't stop it. He's going, he's going to selection if he wants to go to selection. And so they're like, fine. And so I remember them the basically instead of like the good luck, you know, like um, you're on your way to selection, was basically like, you'll be back. And you went behind their backs. So right, they yeah. I want to see you. Come oh, they back. weren't happy about the phone call. Uh-huh. They weren't happy about me just not shutting up and doing what I'm told. They weren't happy about any of it. Uh, and so, and as I go to selection, basically their last message was, you'll be back, which was great. Cause what I find out later on in life is I'm figuring out who I am, you know, as, as a man is that I'm ultra competitive and I'm petty. Oh, I'm petty. <laughs> So you don't seem that uh, way though. Well, I, I'm not. I, like, I try to hide give it. me an example of this. Um, oh, you can't even give me no. no oh, way. I'll, I can. <laughs> and don't get me wrong. Twenty year old Brent was different than thirty year yeah. old Brent, which is now different than forty year old Brent. Uh, Mid twenty year old, like just a couple combat deployments under my belt. Dive supervisor, Green Beret sniper Brent was arrogant and would let you know. And it. Uh, not to everyone, yeah. but you know, if you were a Green Beret that I didn't think met the standard, I'm going to let you know you're fat and you probably shouldn't be a Green Beret. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, you know young 30 year old, you know, Dell's Force Brent was just as an error, was just as arrogant, you know, and if, you know, you better, you better beat me at everything or else, or else I'm going to let you know that I'm better than you. Um, back in my mid thirties, I started, I started humbling out a little bit, yeah. uh, but what's, what you, what's, what you want though? You know, I don't want, I don't want a 25 year old green Bray to be super humble and nice and be a, a, an ultra nice guy and is questioning himself whether he should chew that guy in the face or not. It's not what I want. You don't want a Delta force operator that doesn't think when he's on the other side of that wall in a hostage rescue mission, you don't want him thinking, am I the best in the world? You want him thinking he's the best in the world and he's more than happy yeah. to prove it to you every day. That's who you want. But also as you get older, you should probably, you know, you, you should, uh, you should change. And Do, does that humility come from an event or is it like over time it erodes? Both. Yeah. Events that, that prove that you're older and not as good as, as you and maybe were. not invincible and, and you're not invincible. Right. Yeah. Yeah, getting shot was a humbling experience. Yeah. Um, and just getting a little bit older and wiser, if you will. But you know, when I when I had young guys on my team, um, even though I, you know, I became a very kind of you know soft spoken, didn't say a lot, give me my opinion if you ask, but you know, wasn't as rambunctious. I still really enjoyed that out of my younger guys. And if they weren't, I'd push them to that be. aggressive, kind that's of right. like more opinionated. Yeah, that's right. And if they weren't, I'd push them to be. I like having a mix of those people on the team where <laughs> Some people get uncomfortable because someone's so assertive, right? But I think the dynamics can work out really well <laughs> if you've got it. Um, where do we? Where's, um, I went on a tangent. Oh, so special. I'm. I'll tell you. I'll tell you how I'm petty. <laughs> I. Uh, yeah, it was 18 years ago. You know, when of of my of my when when I retired. You know, it's like 18, 17 years ago uh, that I retired. After that. When I retired, one of my first thoughts was, I wonder if anyone's still back at that air defense unit, because I would love to go back there and show my 214 in their face that says the Delta Force. Me like, not only did I make it to the Special Forces, I've been the only guy in air defense to ever make it to the Delta Force. <laughs> and look at all these awards and look at all these schools. You want to say sorry? Like, 
And then I kind of chuckled to myself going, I'd show up to that unit. No one knows who I am. Everyone's they're all long they're gone. They're all long gone. Like, who is this weirdo upset at this unit that I think, oh. according to his 214, he might have been in the Delta Force? But I don't believe it because I don't know why he's here. Um, you got to imagine even like the Sergeant Major of that unit was probably 42 <laughs> or something at the time. They're 60 <laughs> something now. Right. So that's yeah. how pet I am. When I retired, oh. I thought about Going back to my air defense unit and rubbing it in their face when I did my career. All right. I I could I guess you could call that petty, but I I would also <laughs> want to do that. So I, I can't hold that against you. So so I, so they tell me we will see you again, which was great because it was oh, the greatest motivation. It had to be so oh, like you could on, probably just feast on that. Oh yeah, on my worst day at selection when I had nothing more to give, I would think about having to go back to that unit as a non-select or, or quitter and, and validating their opinion of, of me. And it just, it was easy. A selection was not difficult for me because physically it was, but like the mental aspect of it, like quitting just was never an option because of a little bit. Cause, cause my, cause my pettiness it, it play, play, it play, yeah. plays a, a, a part in it. So when I got back, so I get back and I'm selected and I'm like, Good to see you boys again. I'm uh, selected to be a Green Beret. <laughs> and uh, they could care less. They yeah. were like, you know what? You think you're a Green Beret? You'll be back. Half the people wash out, you know, the Q uh, course, in the like, Q course. You're not, you're, you know, you probably barely made selection. You'll be, and you'll, you'll be back. So we'll see you. And, uh, and I was like, no way. Like I didn't, they didn't even give me the satisfaction yeah. of being selected. <laughs> um, so yeah, this, they could care less about about any of my accomplishments. Oh, geez. You know, that's one of the things I hear often talking, especially the tier one guys, that like there was no chance you were quitting. Now there was a, there's often a different reason for it. Yes. Like yours, you know, probably comes from several, but including this that you yeah. just shared. Right. But it's just like, it's not even an option in your mind. Yeah. When you got guys going to Delta Force selection, you know, I won't give numbers at a Delta Force selection, um, but what you do have there of whatever numbers are there are the best seals in the world, the best Rangers in the world, the best green berets in the world, the best ADA the best, guys, the, the, <laughs> the best the former air defense yeah. guys, you know, in the world. And you say, well, you should probably say in America. No, our special operations is the best in the world. Yeah. You have the best guys in the world there. You're not going to get them to quit. Like, and like you said, they may quit, but it's, it's, it's a little bit for different reasons. And so I say that, um, you know, if a guy, messes up his Achilles tendon like super bad. He's old enough to go, you know what? I'm not gonna make the standard yeah. with a with with a ruptured Achilles tendon. I'm only gonna give you know, give myself long, you know, long enduring, you know, like, you know, effects of trying to, you know, so I'm going to quit because it makes no sense to continue on. Yeah. Like you'll get a quitter out of yeah, that guy. But because there is no med drops, you know, in selection. So mm. you can't you can't look at the med and be like, look, but you know, my ankle, it's it's hanging by a thread. You know, he'll just be like, do you wish to continue candidate? No, my ankles, it's hanging by a thread. You know, med, because these guys don't want to say the word quit. They want you to say, oh, you have to be med dropped. You know, you can't carry on. Well, they're not going to get that. So they're going to force you to to say, to say I quit. That's um, tough. That's oh, real tough. Gosh. I did not know that. Yeah. Oh. It's a, uh, it's. Yeah, and as a you know, as a selection instructor, it's it's uh, it's tough to watch. It's probably heartbreaking yeah, to see awesome. somebody yeah. do that, especially you know. And these guys, you know, if they're at their selection, they're, they're here trying out for their dream job. They're here trying out for for what they have worked. Some of these guys, you know, you just don't. You have to understand this. They don't. It's not like a whim. They go to Delta Force selection. Some of these guys have had this idea from the moment they within the first year or two they're on a team, and they may not have told everyone this. They've been secretly building up this packet, this, you know, this resume to go to Delta Force. I want to, I want to go to dive school and then I want to go to sniper school and then I want to go, I want this deployment, I want that deployment because not only is it good for your career, but secretly like this will look really good as a, as a, sure. as a selection packet. And eventually before they go, they'll tell you that. Or when you tell them, Hey, you know, I'm going to selection. Do you want to go to selection? They're like, Oh, well, there's a few more things I want to do to round out my, my packet. Um, and what you'll find out is a lot of guys have intentions of trying out for Delta force and they've been cultivating this perfect resume to do it. 
And then what you find out is they forget the most important steps of building a resume. What do you think the last important step of a resume is? Submitting it. Submitting it. Submitting it. Uh, and, and at some point, they're a senior E7. They're comfortable with where they're at. They're, you know, they're about to be the next team sergeant, possibly. Uh, and they're like, you know what? I don't know if I want to go be a new guy somewhere and have to, you know, get treated like that and earn my spot all over again. You know, it's and you like, might fail. You probably haven't failed in a long time. And now you're that. a big fish in a small pond. Yeah. And if you fail, which the, the the numbers are against you. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much of a badass you are from what Ranger Regiment, SEAL Team, or Green Beret group you came from. The numbers are not for you. You will you will more than likely not be selected. And that's just how it is. And so it's really hard to be the man on campus and think you could go rather than go and prove you weren't good enough. Yeah. Like it's it, absolutely that plays a part in it. Oh, I'm trying to imagine, do you want to continue or not? And you have to say no. Right. Cause like you got this medical. Right. <sighs> yeah. It's at, I'd say there's so it's much tough. luck involved at, to be, to end up, you know, where I ended up and the schools that I went to and the selections that I went to and to, if you really, you know, and have walking through the woods and up mountains and deployments, you know, right. as well as the real say, world. Fitting all of that training in. Right. With, and to be healthy enough, you know, to, to, to do what I do is that I'll, I'll straight up tell you, there's, there's, that is not because I'm some su superhuman. That was luck. You know, there's a lot of guys that were stronger than me, better than me. And then, you know, tore an ACL on a mountain, you know, up, up, up or down Afghanistan. And they were never the same. Yeah, they could still be on a team, but they were never going to go to Delta Force selection. It just, you know, they, they just weren't going to be able to to take that endurance or a back injury or or you name it or go to or be injured during selection. There's so many yeah. opportunities to sprain an ankle during selection. It's just the luck that goes along with it is is off the charts. So I mean, I was without a doubt good enough. But a lot of guys were good enough. Um just being but everything lined up. Yeah, everything yeah. just yeah, they don't understand how much everything has to line up as well to be able to do that. Man. Or get sick. Hey, oh, you could sure. get sick and uh and people also don't realize it's like going to selection is a window, whether it's special forces selection or delta force selection. Like there's a couple year window in your career that everything kind of lines up that you can do that. Too early is just too early, too late just ends up being too late. And if they don't end up putting their packet and going in that window. They're really never going to do it, you know, whether that's the prime for their, you know, as, you know, physically or mentally. Sure. Family, family, family comes up. Huge. This guy's a stud, wants to go to Delta Force Selection, meets one of his dreams. She gets pregnant. She doesn't want to go to Delta Force Selection. He never goes to Delta Force Selection. And so he missed his window. So, you know, and to be in that window, and you're only going to go once and you got the flu while you were there. Like, yeah. Like there's so many variables. It's crazy. I still remember one of the advanced tradecraft courses I went to at the agency, like very small number of people go in. Mm -hmm. Lots of people fail out. <laughs> I had two kids. We, we had just had our third son and all my kids were under the age of five. Yeah. And there's just a handful of us in the class. And one of the instructors pulls me out after the first day. He's like, you're an idiot for being here. <laughs> you will never make it through this. <laughs> never. Yeah. You know? And I, much like you, I was like, you know, in my mind, fuck you. There's yeah. no chance I'm not making it through this. Yeah. But, it, but it was, it's very different when the family's on their own and it, I, it could be hard. I don't want to jump ahead too yeah. far or get random with it. But when my girls, I had twin girls born in, um, 2012 and I was in Afghanistan, excuse me. I was in Afghanistan with the Delta force and uh, when they were born, Brent? when they were getting born of sorts. Okay. And so they're tracking it. They know we're about to have, you know, I'm about to have twins. And, um, of course, you know, early 30 year old Delta force sprint doesn't want to miss a mission. I mean, I want to see my kids be born. Don't get yeah. me wrong, but I want to be on as many missions as possible. And then see my kids be born and then come back as soon as possible. I don't want you don't want to miss a mission. So I took the last, the last train out of there, so to speak. I get there, um, has the babies a couple of days later. Uh, her parents come in. She's healthy. Babies are healthy. She has help. And and I'm ready to go back. I'm like, saw the babies happen. I, back to war. 
And um, I call, I write an email to my team leader. I'm like, hey, um, I'm coming back. Everything's great. Can't wait to see you. Don't, don't, don't kill too many people without <laughs> me. And uh, I, I'm on a, I'm on this rotator a couple days later. I'll, you know, be prepared. I go back, you know, hang out with the family a little bit and I'm coming into work every day to get, get my stuff ready, you know? So the next day I come to work and I uh, get an email that says, do not get on the plane. Call me. I'm like, what? I wonder what's going on. And I call him and uh, I said, uh, Hey, what's uh, what's up? I got your message. He goes, yeah, don't come out here, Brent. He goes, um, our troop sergeant major heard that, that, yeah, I let him know is, Hey, Brent's coming back. And he goes, what? He goes, Brent's not coming back. He goes, no, no, Brent. He says, the kids are fine. Brent wants to come back. And he goes, Brent will stay there with his wife and his kids. And if he, and if I see him in Afghanistan, he's fired. And I asked my team leader, I was like, was he serious when he said that? He goes, he sounded pretty serious. I wouldn't come out here, Brent. <laughs> what a great <laughs> call by that guy. Huh? And I was pissed. Oh, I sure. was pissed. There was only like a, a month left in the deployment, but I wanted that month and I was pissed. And as I got older and more senior or in the organization, I look back at that and I go, that guy was so, so right. Such a he, he'd, been a, he'd been a part of war for 10 years yeah. when he made that decision. And he knew, and, and probably his 16 deployments, that there's another, there, there will be, the war isn't going away anytime soon. There will be another mission. There will be another time. You're, you'll be home with your kids. That's great. And I hated it. And at the time, and I couldn't respect him any more after afterwards. God, I got pulled out of the farm or training in the last month to see my third son be born. Yeah, and I got twenty four hours, and then they pulled us back in. <laughs> and my wife, I, I was like, I could, I, I could try to stay longer, yeah. and she's like, You go back there. If you fail, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> like we are not repeating this. Yeah, your ass over right. There. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, get through it in one. Don't recycle anything. It's so difficult to not make it and then go back yeah. and have to go through and, and the same parts. Of that that, that's right. Can I ask, Brent? So when you said you were over there, like obviously your wife's pregnant, and you said you didn't want to miss a mission. Yeah. I think people listening who have never been a part of an elite unit like that, they might see wanting to do that when you're in SF thinking like, I need to get these missions under my belt to make it into Delta. But you're already in Delta. Oh. What, what is the... Why get another mission in? Because it resets. No one cared what I did in special forces. They they didn't. Like, you know, if we're in mission planning as a new guy, and like, hey, I got eight deployments under my belt in special We saw a mission like this in special forces. And let me just give me my let me give you my two cents about what worked for us. They'd stop you right there. Like, I mean, shut up, kid. Like, no one cares what you did in the minor leagues. Welcome to the major leagues. They just didn't care. They didn't care where you came from. You know, they call it TID, time and delta. That's all they care about. <laughs> they don't respect anything else except and and although that sounds kind of brash, after a decade of it, they're not wrong. Like the yeah. targets that tier one elements go after on a on a nightly basis, you know, are so much so much um more exciting yeah. uh, than 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 other ones. Yeah, you, you have a higher level target, you know. He knows he's a higher level target. He has a you know a protective detail with him. He knows that uh, you know, with everything in his history, he's not he's probably not going to be favored by going through the jail you know, the judicial system and getting let out. He's you know he's there ready to die, um, and so they're they're fun targets. They're, it's a whole different set of set of game, if uh, if you will. So. Yeah, so you you have to because you know they 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 don't know you, they don't care where you came from, they don't care how many diplomas you had before that. All they know about you is what you've is what they've seen you do. So you're proving it to them. One hundred percent. It's not like I'm. I need to get this because I need this next promotion or yeah, you know, school. Oh, right. Like you've got them all. I would right. assume it. Absolutely, that you're proving to your other teammates and the other teams and everyone else there wow. that, that, that you belong there. Now, OTC is 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 well respected like if you graduate otc you're in the club like not they don't think you belong there you belong he here and then and then that's it you know like they they know you belong here but then you have to you know constantly. really you have constantly proven you have to constantly prove you belong here and uh you know and there's and the only the only thing they really that they really um respect 
is what you is what they can see you do in combat. Yeah. They don't care how good you cleared rooms and training. They don't care what kind of if you're an amazing skydiver. I mean, they they kind of care. But in the, the day, they they want to watch you on a real mission and see what you really do. And they can't wait to see you on a on a on a uh, on a hairy mission and see what you're really made of because they've things. done it and they know what they're made of and they know what everyone else is made of and they can't wait to see what you're really made of. Jeez. So you can't wait to prove that to them. And you have to wait you know, as a new guy. You have to wait for a deployment to be able to prove to them that that you that you do belong here. And once you're on that deployment, you don't want to go home because no. of, because of kids. That sounds so horrible, it, it, but it's true. Like deep down, I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to do a show like this. Just in general, was people hear that, and I think a normal person would just say like that's wrong. Like somebody shouldn't think that way. But that's when you want to go and take bad and, guys out. That's who you need in the room. And I, and I would agree with them. I would say right. you are you are correct. That is not right. Um, my, um, that's the word I'm looking for. My balance in life was was imbalanced. But then I'll always also have to say this. My, if you want to make it to the Delta Force, or you even want to make it as a Green Bray first, your balance in life will never be balanced. If you want to make it to those those upper echelon um, organizations, you can throw balance in life out, yeah. out the window. If it doesn't consume you and who you want to be and what you want to do in every aspect of your life, and you're not in balance with work, you either won't make it or you won't be there long. So yeah, my, my, my life balance was off and that's why I was there. Yeah. So if we back up to, you, you know, you go through selection, you make it through the Q course, what group do you end up going to? 20th group, 20th. which is the National Guard group. I go to 20th group. I was in the National Guard when I, when, I, uh, when I went to selection. Of course, you go to the regular selection. Everyone else goes to the same Q course and all that. And then um, I, uh, I go to 20th group because I, I came from there. Yep. Uh, and I spend the next basically like seven years um, uh, assigned there as a – the best way to describe it is AGR, which is active guard. Yep. Although I technically was not active guard, I was just a guard bum. Is is the is the the loose term for it, which just means there's a, because wartime was there. There's always another set of orders you can jump from, and I just went from orders to orders to orders to orders, and uh, and I just I stayed active, you know, through just this one year set of orders and this six month set of orders and this next school. And I loved it. I wouldn't have. It was the best. If I wanted to go. To, my my first 18 months in group, I went from dive school. No, I'm sorry. I went from South America to dive school, straight to Iraq, straight to Afghanistan, and then home for three weeks and straight to Iraq. That's how I was a busy, you know. Yeah. I knocked out two deployments, thought, well, three deployments technically, you know, three, South America. two yeah. combat deployments, yep. three deployments, and dive school. And none of my other active duty friends, like, they're on their first deployment, and I'm over here gathering badges and, and crushing it. Do you I know loved Bob it. Keller? Went to dive school with Bob Keller. Uh, so it's so funny you say this because I remember him saying, he's like, look. Went to South America with Bob Keller. He was he, on that South America he, deployment. He goes, also a Delta guy for people who, who are listening who haven't heard that interview we did with him. He was also a 20th group guy, right? Yeah. yeah and yeah, I remember him company. saying, he's like, people want to, they want to look down on, on the guard side of SF. He's like, those guys were next level. I loved it. He, he said they were so good. He's like, they're, they weren't Delta level. That's a, a, a jump, right. but they were not like lower tier than, than these other groups out there. There are different companies out there and some companies aren't as good as others. But the one that me and Bob came yeah. from was Alpha 320. And I'm telling you that special forces company, you know, those five to six ODAs could, could rival any Active duty company. That's the way he would say and, it. And yeah. 100, and that is 100% true. It, it just is. That company put out, I won't name all their names. Um, me, well, me and At Bob. At least two of you. Me, went me into and Bob. Delta. Me and Bob. Jeez. Um, TH went. ST went. AA went as a, as a medic. He tried out as an assaulter. He ended up as a medic. Um, but there's four. I'm, I'm probably, oh. Uh, trying to, um, CC went 
I know of five assaulters that went from that company and one and one medic out of one National Guard company. And I may be forgetting a guy. And, and During were, a, probably a narrow window of time, that's right. too, right? All within three years. And no one, only that's one cool. guy had ever that's made cool. it from our company before that. And I don't know how many have, you know, have made it, you know, post that. Yeah. But that's an insane, at one point, be, because of us, like the recruiters even came up and it's like, you know, 20th Group has the highest rate of success and selection what right are y'all now? doing down okay, here right. what do you guys do and it was like in a this lot of and, florida and there were more more guys from it wasn't just us but most of them came all from a320 and like most came from your company like you know the recruiters want to know like what's what's going on down yeah. there like like is there something we you know we you know we should know or, or, or do or, or continue right and it was just a weird period of time um it's like alabama or georgia feeding the nfl yeah yeah it was just crazy and probably what happened i was you know i was i was uh i was so good that i made all those guys better and just me being there you know really you totally take, you take me out of that equation i don't think bob's it's probably there. not bob's out of here. Right. I'll, that's a joke but i'll tell you this real quick uh and uh sorry 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 to tell this story bob <laughs> Bob's a great dude. Yes. He so he's so good. He had to put up with me in dive school and my snoring. And he was my roommate. He was my roommate in dive school. Uh, dive school did not affect Bob. He was a physical specimen. Dive school greatly affected me. <laughs> 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 like to the point where I showed up at the pool every morning going, God, I hate this. I hate this. Um, I even called my dad and said, Dad, uh, I may come. I, I think I'm going to come home. No way. I did. And I was like, he was like, I thought you were in dive school, Brent. My, and my dad, let me tell you when my dad started to become my buddy, like more than just. Yeah. My, is why, you know, when dad, he's always loved Vietnam and love, love pilots, love special operations. When I became a Green Bear, my dad, I got all sorts of questions, you know, and, and wanted to know, you know, things. And my first phone call, I know I'm hopping around a lot. Yeah, my first great. phone call after selection, when I got selected as a Green Beret. I was I was able to go make a phone call. I called my dad. And I said, "Dad, I made it. Your son's going to be a Green Beret." And he's like, "Awesome." When in West Virginia, when I got selected to be in the Delta Force, my very first phone call was, "Let's well, was, was repeat this." My very first phone call was my dad. Say your boy's going to the Delta Force. He was a proud son. Um, you know, and there's and if I've my dad was a you know very hard person growing up. Yeah. Just to hear those words, proud of your son at age 30. You probably means, hadn't heard him very often. Was, oh, yeah. It means, means the world to me. Uh, and um, back up to Bob. It, rabbit trail there. And so uh, Bob was, was having issues on the academic side. And his, <laughs> his fiance at the time, uh, which is now his wife, yeah. Was coming that weekend, and if you and he's and he's about to get put. If he didn't pass, he's going to get put on academic probation, which means he couldn't take his girlfriend to Key West. <laughs> and so there I am. Of course, he couldn't. I needed help with the pool, but Bob can't swim. Can't swim beside me to help me at the pool, but I can help him at academics. Yeah. And we would stay up late, you know, and I would sit there with Bob, like, "Hey, this is this is. Let's go over this." you know, redive designator and, and, you know, find out, you know, this, you know, we go through all the, the numbers and I, and I, I say, I got him through dive school, but yeah. definitely had to help out Bob okay. and, 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 and dive school. Um, I mean, he was a pro golfer. What, what are we expecting on the academic side? <laughs> all right. And he does yeah. look like a big guy. Oh, he, he's, a physical specimen. Uh, yeah. I went, I went to um, selection with them too. Delta Force selection didn't 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 phase Bob a whole lot either. He's the guy's just a physical. We were we were man, I step this all the way back. It was called NQPs. When you're in 20th group and you want to go to selection, it's a non-qualified personnel. So you're in this like mm. pre-selection program for 20th group. And 20th group owns you, but you're not in the Q course and you're not an ODA guy. So you're in this weird realm because you're in the national yeah. guard where they have they they own you first you're assigned to 20th group so their job is just to get you ready for selection and me and bob were nqps together in 20th group and uh and i've i'm pretty good at rucking as you, you'd imagine I'd imagine yeah. um never beat bob in a ruck <laughs> never beat bob in a ruck but which was great because as a guy who really was is very competitive and to have bob as an nq bob keller as an nqp to show you what a stud looks like and what the standard is. And like, this is what truly, yeah. you know, 
you know, what truly physical fitness really looks like. And then to be able to watch Bob and see what he does and see what his workouts were and see what he ate and see what he did to get that and then be able to emulate that was, was, was huge for me. I was going to ask, it wasn't just, he wakes up and he's good no. to go. Like, he, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bob had some, had some really unique and crazy workouts and, uh, he was, he, he was, he was great to, to, uh, to watch and, and then, and then, and then work out with. And, you know, oddly enough, like I said, we both became Green Berets together. We both go to the same company. We go, we both go to Delta Force together. I've known Bob for a long time. He's a great guy. You know, I'm glad you went on that tangent because you mentioned, and I think didn't finish this part, which was you call your dad to say, I think I'm coming home. But oh. What does he say then? I can't even, I mean, had you quit something before? No, no. And um, I'm glad you brought that back up. So this is my closest point in my life, dive school, bro, took me to my- Had you already recycled or anything? No. 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 Right. Thank God I didn't because I wasn't going back. I don't know if I was Mentally, that would have just been- it, it was. It was- one of the problems was, is I went to South America and then flew straight from South America to die school. And I say why that's a problem is because they tell me, hey, um, we don't have funding, funding ran out and you're not going to die school. We don't have, we can't, we can't fund it. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll just party in South America is my, is my, my first trip with the boys. Yeah. And that's what I did. Now, Bob did too. And Bob was also told, you're not going to dive school. He was in South America with me. But what Bob could stomach, what Bob could uh, physically could could take a time off and still crush dive school, Brent could not do. <laughs> I needed that trade-up period yeah. uh, to get through dive school. So even though Bob wouldn't party down in South America right next to me, he still crushed dive school and dive school crushed me. Um so I'm sitting there. Um, I've already called my dad and said, hey, I think I'm going to come home. And I was like, all right, well, I don't know what you're going through, but whatever you got to do, you know, you can come home if you want, which I didn't expect him to say He doesn't. Yeah, yeah. I guess hearing about your dad, I, I expect him to say, yeah, just tough yeah. it out. Um, I don't remember him saying, I might have to talk to him, see if he remembers this. Like, he may give me some encouragement and try to dissuade me a little bit, from, but I don't really, I don't. Generally speaking, I just remember going, okay, I mean, do do what you got to do. Um, and I get, I would show up to the pool every morning, just crushed that I had to get back in that stupid pool again and, and drown again today. So um, we have this very last event and they, sometimes they do these events called pays to be a winner. And if you win the event, you can get out of the pool. And if you don't win the event, you got to keep doing the event until you win. Uh, you know, they slowly oh. take someone out of the pool. Oh. So the pool is in an L shape. It's an L shaped pool, like this way and that way. And this long way, got to guess, is 75 meters. And they said, hey, um, bring an extra shirt to the pool today. So we brought this. But at the end of the day, they, they go get that extra shirt and take off your shirt. And so they make you hold the shirt, one shirt in each hand. And they had us freestyle from this end of the pool to that end of the pool with with shirts in our hand and a closed fist and um and they said remember guys pays to be a winner so everyone swims as hard as they can to the other side and of all the things i'm a little bit weak in in dive school freestyle swimming i'm i'm a fast i'm a fast swimmer um we had a guy there that was actually an olympic swimmer <laughs> I'm uh, not surprised. so i i smartly said you know what i can't beat him but i'm a I'm going to give it about 80% and make it look like I'm with the crowd. And on my third heat, I'm going to give it all I got. I'm going to get out of the pool. I'm going to get out of the pool by, you know, by number three or four. So first, so they say it pays to be a winner. Everyone goes as hard as they can out of the pool. And uh, the winner wants to get out. He's like, uh, yeah, but we're not, you're not going to get out of the pool just yet. But remember, guys, pays to be a winner. They won't let the winner out. They don't let the winner out. They keep sending us back and forth and back and forth. They're not letting the winner out. And I remember – you know, uh, going, I'm, I have nothing like, I have nothing left, nothing left in the gas tank. And I'm thinking if they send me back over, like, I don't know if I can make, I don't know if I can physically make it to the end of the pool. Like I'm going to drown. And I was like, man, if they send me over, they send me back one more time, I quit. And then the whistle blows. I'm like, well, I'm going to do it one more time. And I, I can barely make it to the other side. And I tell myself again, they send me one more time. F this, I quit. This is stupid. This has gotten stupid now. 
they're pulling guys out of, you know, out of the pool with cramps, you know, that you know, to pull them off the bottom of the pool if they've cramped up and can't swim and they're just exhausted. And they're just sinking. And they're just sinking. I mean, this is like, this just gotten stupid. I'm not doing this. And uh, I look at the guy next to me and we both have this pathetic moment of my eyes looking his eyes and we both are like, this sucks. And you kind of just shake your head a little bit like, this sucks. And uh, I'm thinking, I'm going to quit. It's it's time. Like I'm going to quit. I physically can't do it. I'm uh, trying to figure out how to say the words I quit. And he puts his head down for a second. And he gets out of the pool, which means he quits. And I remember looking at him getting out of the pool and going, you effing quitter. How could you? How could you live with yourself? You, you quitter. Disgusted at him for quitting. When I was on the, and there was something about him quitting that disgusted wow. me and gave me all sorts. Of, I could I could have swam back and forth ten more laps, and uh, that's 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 what got me through uh, selection on, or uh, through dive school was watching someone that wow. close to me quit and be disgusted at him when I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was the closest I ever came to quitting. I'm so glad I didn't. I would, I am, I am competitive. I would have gone to back to die school. I would have trained up for it properly and yeah. went back and crushed it. But I'm so glad I didn't have to. Oh man. So glad I, didn't I hear have that to. so often at how hard that course is. Yeah. It was miserable. And I've, I've heard guys who have partied too hard on their weekend there before it starts <laughs> and had really rough well, Mondays. My- my favorite thing about uh, about diet school is the is the uh, is the Friday safety safety briefings, and what they'll do is like the first time they're like, "All right, guys, here's a safety briefing. You know, don't do anything stupid. Be you know, work starts again. At, you know, Monday roll call at six a.m. Whatever it is, and they always end it with a crazy story that's actually true. Of course, like so, guys, make sure you don't get so drunk that you get beat up by a midget. Because you will go back to fifth group and they and they will all know that it happened and it will follow you the rest of your career. I'm like, that story is awful specific. Like, is that a real story? Did a guy get beat up by a midget? And they're like, oh, yeah, guys. And they, they, they tell you the story about a guy who got so wasted and was enamored by this midget and was poking at him, poking at him, poking at him. And this midget whipped his ass. I mean, whipped his ass. Uh, and, and he was clearly a fifth group guy also, <laughs> right? So you got that specificity. So, right. Oh, yeah. And all sorts of, hey, guys, uh, just know government uh, government travel cards are meant for government travel purposes. <laughs> and you can't run up a $5,000 bill each uh, getting VIP treatment at the local strip club. That is not what they're for. And you will get in trouble for that. And, like, and we're like, again, that's awful specific. Oh. Like. Everyone knows that you not to use your GTC card at a strip club. Right. Right? Uh, apparently not the case. I mean, every so every Friday. Oh, here's last one. No. Uh, one of my favorite ones is, hey, guys, just know if you miss formation Monday morning and we put you in the water for a swim, we know how many people went in the water. So when one more person comes out of the water – we know you missed it, and you tri- and, and so this guy knew that Monday morning they had a, an open water swim. <laughs> he missed formation, and so uh, I forget the name of the bay there, a, Fl- a Fleming Bay, I think it's Fleming Bay, is is big like this, and they you kind of start at the end of Fleming Bay and you swim, you know, for you know for this Monday's iteration. So he missed formation. So he just started. He he just waited at the banks over there and and waited for the boats to put all the guys in, and then he just got in and got That's in with the try. mix. That's and, a good try. And yeah, and I was like, oh, bold maneuver, cop, bold maneuver. <laughs> it's every Friday, it was just a ridiculous story after a ridiculous oh, story, and I loved it. That's so good. Yeah. All right. So that's obviously dive dive school. Take us to your first time in a combat theater, for you personally. Um, so it's with Af- 20th group. Yes. With okay. 20th group, Afghanistan. Um, and it was, it was glorious. It actually ruined me because, um, you know, I wanted to go to combat so bad. And then I get this delay of this, of air defense, which, yeah. which really delayed me, you know, getting to my goal because it, it didn't send me to combat. Even if it did, I, it wouldn't have been what I wanted. 
And so then I decided to go through the largest pipeline. Yeah, the Q course ain't short. <laughs> I decided right? to go through the largest pipeline the military has. And a year and a half later, almost two years later, I get my green bray and I'm now deployable. Um, so it was just a long time to actually get to combat. And I get there and, and you know, it's just been a long time coming. And um, we get this mission um, and it was a daytime mission. So, I mean, I'd, I'd read as many special operation books as I could in the Q course. If there was a, if there was a green beret or even navies, any, any book about current special, special forces or special operations in Afghanistan, I was picking it up and I was reading it even in Vietnam. Like I wanted to, even though I hadn't been there yet, I wanted to learn as much as I could about people who have, and I thought it'd give me a better understanding of what I'm getting into. And it absolutely did. Yeah. So glad, so glad I, I read all those books. Um, so we get this daytime operation mission as our as our as our as our first mission. I already know like this isn't normal. Like we don't normally do a daytime hit. Um, it was a high value target that was having a basically a bad guy barbecue, and he was having all his bad guy friends over for a bad guy barbecue. And I'm like, hey, like they're all here now. As far as we know, intelligence wise, most of them won't spend the night. We this is when they'll all be together. It's too juicy of a target to not hit during the daytime. Let's we're going to send it. So they brought in a seventh group team, us and uh, and a few Afghans and Chinooks. And we're going to go hit this target in the daytime. Quick planning and and, and out the door. Conventional like, Chinooks. Yeah, uh, yes. Conventional okay. Chinooks. Um, quick planning out the door, which is great. I mean, it's what a, I mean, at the end of the day, so much of your planning in the Q course is based off of MDMP, military decision making process and long term planning and course of action planning we have all night the, to make three different course of actions and go now don't get me wrong some of the planning is is also short term but a lot of the planning that green berets do is very intentional mm -hmm. like they're great planners and to get thrown this thing is like you got a couple hours and you're out the door it was very delta force like it was awesome um and so we're out the door and uh the seventh group team is in front of us on on the chinook and so you know, I'm nowhere near the front. I can't wait to get off this. I mean, but I mean, my legs are shaking. I'm nervous. You know, was this I, this is your first op? First op. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I just I'm ex I'm both nervous, scared, excited. Yeah, you know, I'm 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 all of it. And I'm looking out. You know, on a, on a 47, they got those little circular fishbowl windows of sorts. And they got the, and they got cargo nets along with the seats too. We're hanging on this cargo net. We're looking out, and yeah, I can see that we're descending. And we're getting low, we're getting low, we're getting low. Now, I don't have the most experience, but as we're about 10 feet off the ground, I'm thinking, we're coming in hot. Like, like I, you know, I have very limited aircraft experience, but according to my math, this is hot. But I didn't want to say anything and be that guy that's like, hold on, yell something. <laughs> and everyone's like, what are you doing, weirdo? That's how it comes in. But we're thinking, that's who doesn't look good. We're like five feet off the ground and coming in super fast. I'm like, nope, I, I I know what wrong. I don't know what right looks like. I know what wrong looks like. And I turn to the guy behind me, Bill, 20th group guy, and I go, hang on, like that. And it and it comes in like skidding into this uh, moon dust of a of an LZ. And everybody who was not holding on or holding on tight enough all fell down. And as they fell down, the competitive of uh, the competitiveness, you know, of me like. It's my opportunity. And I run over every single one of those guys. I mean, I'm to get to the ramp. I'm stepping on them. <laughs> I'm like, see you suckers. <laughs> and Bill's right behind me. We did. We literally walked over people and we're the, and now me and Bill first one off the ramp. And now I realize like a dog chasing a car. I got what I wanted. Like I'm first off, but I don't know where it, it, you get the really tough realization. Yeah. If you can study the overhead of, you know, of this, all you want. That's an overhead view, and it definitely helps. But when you're standing there, everything looks different. Everything either looks further away. It might look a little closer. It might look bigger. That it's not the. It's usually a black and white photo they give of it, mm -hmm. uh, They they give to you, and now the colors aren't what you had. And you're just nothing matches up. Like, and so now I'm running, but I don't know where I'm running to. I'm like, uh, this looks. <laughs> familiar but oh dang it i don't know where, what's the target house and bill's like no that way is the target house that way 
And, uh, and, the, and things started finally like, oh, okay. I had to get my grasp. And I was like, okay, things are starting to, to make sense. And as, as I'm finally now running the right direction, um, I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't like 180 out. I was just running towards this and I didn't know which one it, which, which building it was. I managed to find out which, you know, Bill's pointing at it. I find out what I think is the right building. Luckily it was. I'm seeing like dirt things pop up like all around me. Now, again, uh, this is all just a matter of seconds that the helos are still trying to get people off of them and, and they're trying to take off. I can't hear anything, you know? And what I realize after things get quiet and the helos, you know, 10, 15 seconds later, and, and that big bird finally unasses the, the AO is those are, those are rounds firing all around me, all around me. And I didn't know what they were. Never seen it before. I was like, that's weird. All this, it's like some weird Afghan thing where this dirt flies up. It sounds so, Again, it sounds like what you think it was, Brent. But when you're in the middle of yeah. all this chaos and all this newness, and me trying to figure out where I'm running to, like you, you don't, you're not exactly in a problem solving. What is that? Yeah, uh, logical mode as a new guy that's just trying to take it all in for the first time. I'm like, oh shit, they're 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 firing at us, and they're firing us from all over the place. I don't even know where to start returning fire. Well, the the 64s are coming in, and. Uh, so make this real rudimentary. So there's the target. We're running this way. And the 64 comes around, way around and is doing a, a gun run this way. For facing you. Facing us. And man, I'm glad. What's these, what's these little rockets here? Yeah, the 7.62 no, maybe these, rockets. Maybe these little guys. With the, those are the 7.62. Okay. The others are the Hellfires. Okay. He's, so for those listening, uh, Brent's pointing to this uh, uh, blueprint we got up in Apache here. Yes. This is uh, the so rocket pack. Yeah, two points. Yeah, there you go. 7 FFAR rockets. Yeah. That's an awful convenient. As if, and he's shooting on Some of them are hitting the compound, but some are shooting over the compound. Are you and, serious? Yeah. And a couple go go over the compound far and, and like a movie. They're coming right at us. And me and Bill jump different directions and it lands right in between us. And there's dirt, you know, flying from now from our own, you know, uh explosions from friendly from friendly fire. And I remember like getting up off the ground, like wiping the dirt off my face. And I'm like, this is awesome. This is what I signed up for. <laughs> and we're looking at each other. And again, it's almost like like 300. Remember, they just like everything's yeah. going wrong. They just start laughing. Ah, oh, we'll fight in the shade. Me and Bill just look. We both have these big grins on our faces. We're smiling. Then we, we go, you know, we're going back to Target now. And I can hear him laughing, just belly laughing on, on the way. We finally get to Target. That 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 little maneuver of us diving on the ground, let everyone else kind of gave us everyone else an opportunity <laughs> to, to catch up to us. We're all at the compound at the same time. Um, I unfortunately wasn't the one that entered a room, but a couple guys entered a room, you know, with armed men and, 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 and killed people at, at close distance, uh, which you don't always get to do, uh, on target. Um, but I got to walk around obviously, and I know it sounds weird, but yeah, you get to see the dead bodies of a, you know, of a, of an American green Beret that just gunned that dude down the same room from seven feet away. Like it just became very real. That dead guy laying on the ground with a gun could have killed us as easily as as we killed him like and that and that's Easy. and that's the truth of 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 CQB in a general statement so that happens we clear the compound and they ask us uh to stay the night they're like hey strong strong point in that compound we didn't know the whole place was bad like you know the guys you know the command watch and ISR like they weren't happy about the whole village being a bad guy village like hey this is what we're going to do you're going to stay there all night and you're going to do a KLE the next morning and we're going to key leader engagement. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, so meet Thank the you. Please. No, yeah, no, no. Yeah. yeah. Just for people. Yeah. Listening. And we're going to do this key leader engagement and uh, we, we're, you know, we're going to figure out what's, what's wrong with this village. So we stayed there all night and uh, AC 130 stayed and supported us okay. all night. Nice. And about every hour or every other hour, that thing opened fired on things that were that were trying to sneak up on us all night long. Now, it wasn't I'm not sitting here saying like it was just a constant bombardment of them trying to overrun us, but you couldn't go to sleep all night because all night long oh, they were they were 
um, you know, plotting against us and trying to figure out a way to probe our, our defense and, uh, you know, and pay us back for, I'm assuming he's ruining their barbecue. <laughs> um, so in the day, uh, just a great, a great introduction to combat, close quarter combat, call for fire, Chinooks, you know, just every, every near daytime fratricide. operation, near fracture <laughs> side, chaos, chaos, just complete and utter chaos with, with death and destruction here and there. And I didn't see another target like that for a long time. <laughs> But I now think this is what combat is. It's everything I thought it was. It's everything I hoped it was. And then the next like three targets we get there and the guy gives up, you know, no one fires around and we, we, and he's claiming to be someone else. He's not. And, you know, like, you know, you play that game. Um, and you're like, man, this was the first, this, this isn't, I thought they were all like the first time. Yeah. Yeah. So it really ruined me and my expectations <laughs> of, what, of what combat was. What? So, did that Chinook and like, was it actually a hard landing or was it, you just didn't know this is how fast they come in. It sounds like it was a hard landing. Oh, was that, but, oh that was a hard But landing. it didn't it break. It knocked down. No, it, it didn't break, but I, I, we, we went back. It had massive skid marks, uh, and, and, and the ground and <laughs> deep. I mean, it buried that landing gear. Uh, it was, uh, which is what made it such a you know hard brace is sure. because it, there was massive wheels at you know, three points of it all dug into the, to that soft soil and, gave it you know put it went from 60 to zero re real quick i guess you got to see the difference between the conventional army and and 160 at later oh of gosh the touchdown you. like ha having a dead-on rocket coming at you people don't un it, wow that's i don't want to say they're the unsung heroes of special operations everyone knows the 160th or they better yeah they better it's not like, like pre-black hawk down where it was very secretive right but in the day, it's just they don't get a lot of publicity. They don't get a lot of attention. It's just not the set, you know, they're the taxi drivers. Yeah. People want to talk to the shooters. People have no idea how good and amazing the Delta, Delta Force operators are the best in the world at what they do. Well, guess who drives us? The best yep. pilots in the world. And I've seen them park little birds where there was no space. I've seen them do lip landings and high wind. I, I've, I've seen them uh, when I was shot park their Blackhawk in the middle of a field and gladly fight it out with the enemy because they would have ran out of gas and I would have died with blood loss if they wouldn't have done that. Like the things that yeah. they will do for the boys on the ground is, is yeah, just it's is, what is makes amazing. them is amazing. The best. And so if you guys don't know more about the one sick, <laughs> go read a book. Yeah. They're, they're the best. A um, couple things from that. You mentioned the books that you read. Are there any that you still recommend to people who are, because obviously we're talking 15 years back now. First, Many have been written, but. Yeah. First and foremost, um, Gates of Fire. Yeah. That's a great one. The Gates of Fire. That is, without a doubt, that is the psychology behind what it, you know, what, what war is, what elite warriors, I mean, it's. Um, and if you don't know, it's the basis of 300, yep. um, gates of fire, read that book. And if, and if, and if you read that book and you're like, yeah, um, Paul Nikes, that dude's me. If you think that go to selection, there, there's a place for you. <laughs> there's a, We've got a place there's for a, you. There's, there's a place for you. <laughs> if you read that, you're like, these guys are crazy and it's a good, it's an entertaining book, but I want nothing to do with that, with that mentality and lifestyle. Awesome. Enjoy the book. Go be a banker. Yeah. Um, that could be, that could be the single best selection, uh, self-selection of, of your life. Read that book yeah. and, and, uh, you either, you either wish you lived back then and want a part of that, or you want no part of that. So gates of fire first and foremost, um, a really, uh, I read inside Delta force by Eric Haney when I was a green beret. And, um, that was, that was a, he said too much. Um, but it's out that there. was when people were saying nothing, yeah. right? I mean, that's right. Very oh, quiet. He says things that, that, yeah, even though I come on these podcasts, there's a lot of things that, that I don't say, or even if I do talk about it, um, I say it in a way I water it down. I don't use a lot of assets and I don't, you know, yeah. use a lot of details that, that, that I leave out. Sometimes I even change the country because yep. you don't care if it happened nope. in Afghanistan or another country, you know, it doesn't matter. He said a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, 
but it's out there and it's, it's, and it's a historical yeah. book. So it, you know, read it. I mean, it's out there. It's not like you boycotting it is going to take it off the shelf and, no. and, and the Delta Force secrets are now safe. <laughs> uh, so, so go read the book. Um, another really good one is Relentless Strike. Have you heard that one? It's really a book. So. It's really a book about JSOC, but it has, of course, all the JSOC elements, which is a Joint Special Operations Command. If you guys don't know what JSOC is, they're the ones who are the headquarters of uh, SEAL Team Six, Delta Force, mm-hmm. uh, and a couple other Tier One elements on the intelligence side. Mm-hmm. It 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 talks way too much. Um, this is a lot of. It was that that when that book came out, it caused some controversy. But it's a good book. Um, and lastly, it's really not a book about uh, as the Delta Force as much as it is just a good book. The Men, Mission, and Me yeah. by Pete Blader. Blader. Great book. He talks about the Delta Force a little bit, but it's really not. It's, you can tell right away. It's not a look at me book. It's not a look at what I did. Look at these amazing stories. It's a leadership book. And it's a great leadership book. Have you met him? I have not. Labor? No. We've interviewed him twice. Oh, have you really? Recently, again, because he just came out with another book that That's I do right. highly recommend about no. Tillman's death. Okay. And it's, he goes in and interviews so many of the folks there and he does it. I, it reminds me a bit of you with, with uh, first responder coffee. Yeah. Like there's a lot of purpose behind it. It was Tillman's mother asked him, like, I've, I've read four investigations from the army. I don't know what happened to my son. Can you tell me? Like, I understand you're a part yeah. of this community. Yeah. And it's hard to read because of how, even in the Ranger community, yeah. how poorly executed and how much, how much micromanagement went on because of technology at the time. Yeah. Because it gave commanders hundreds of miles away the ability to be to, all to have input. Yeah. When they, when they so shouldn't sad. have any input. So sad. Yeah. I didn't know that. I knew he, I knew he came out with the second book. I didn't yeah, know this, it's what, really what his, good. It's really good. What his second book was about. Um, and in fact, there is, I still use this quote to this day. I read that book as a um, mission me as a Green Beret as well. And he has a story in there about getting treed by a chihuahua. Do you, do you remember? Did I you don't read know the book? this. No, no, okay. I don't know this. So he, he tells a selection story about. Uh, it's funny. I know exactly where he was in selection too. When, the way he, he oh, I do know it. this. Yeah, yeah. And so he hears something in the woods, and he's like, "A, a bear." And now there, and there are bears in West Virginia. And I've seen bears run after candidates before. Uh, <laughs> My God. Um, and uh, uh, and he's like, "There's something moving in the woods. I'm going to climb this tree. It's close. Holy shit! It's a bear." And for whatever reason, somehow I don't know what this chihuahua is doing in the mountains of West Virginia. But as he climbed a tree, uh, he let his worst fears get the best of him, and it's just a chihuahua. And he turned that into a saying: "Hey, don't don't get treated by don't get treated by a chihuahua," which basically means, you know, take it take it at face value for what for what it's worth. Don't let fear drive your decision making process, or else you'll make a major decision and and come to find out that it was nothing to be scared of, and you just. Dis- and you made a whole plan over something that it might yeah. be and it never was. Um, which is really already a, a premise of the military that people forget so much, which is plan for the most likely course of action, but be prepared for the most dangerous course of action. And we change that all the time. Like there are guys that yeah. start, they plan for the most dangerous course of action, and then they're kind of prepared for the most likely course of action. That's insanity. Yeah. And those, these are tenants I've taken, you know, along with me in a business and I've worked out you know, gr- great to be honest with you. That was the exact question I was going to ask you. And, yeah. Yeah. and How are you applying? my, my brother every now and again will get treated by a chihuahua and he'll be like, Hey, this, but what if this, and what if that one? And I'll be like, Hey, don't get treated by a chihuahua, Drew. Let's, that's not, you know, let's not, let's not worry about that, you know? So uh, yeah, that's, that's been a great book. I remember that story. Cause he did, he told that on air. I thought it was a boar or he thought it was. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a, a bear or, a oh, no, or no. something. No, it was a bear. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was either a boar or a bear. Yeah. yeah that's right. But it ended up being a dog, right? Is that what <laughs> right. I'm saying? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And then, and gosh. What, uh, he said something in, in his, at the end of his book. Of that and he did a really good job of alluding to stories and just pulling out yeah, and pulling out the, the, the leadership points of it. 
But uh, I would like to meet him one day because I got a couple of questions about him. Oh, his man. Book and I some think you guys like, hey, would have a great session. You said session. this, but what's the details on on that? Uh, that you know that he left out of the book, and, and for good reason. Man, I, I enjoy. I really enjoyed that book. I, I think his books are underappreciated. Like he doesn't spend a ton of time or money marketing as much as some others might. Yeah, and you're literally hearing from a Delta Force like career yeah. commander and. Um. Yeah. My gosh, I don't want to screw up the name of this book. So all those are are good like historical books. You know, I think there's a lot of, like uh, some a lot of good lessons to be learned on it. But if you want to, um, and even like you know, the Gates of Fire, even though that's a historical book, and it's definitely an entertaining book, but it's definitely one of those like a, a gauge of of who you are, yeah. mentally book. One of the best, just straight up entertaining books, and also kind of a little bit of a gauge of who you are. It's an SAS book about the World War about World War Two, and I might have to look it up here in a second. And it's called, um, uh, gosh. I cannot believe I can't think of the name of this book. Up. Why you look it up? Um, it's called uh, something. Um, gosh, Things you cannot it's, it's, say. It's, it's, it's the right, last of the seven. It's right on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, I'll, I'll, it, it is a book about the forming of the British SAS in World War II. And it's something like, it's not Inglorious Bastards. Either, that's a movie, but it's called something. Um, Rogue Heroes. Rogue Heroes. Uh, ben oh McIntyre? Yes, Rogue it? Heroes. Interesting. So I read this book as a Delta Force guy. And I'm and this is about the uh um the forming of the SOS the of the SAS during World War II and and everything they went through. Now I also read the book Delta Force by Charlie Beckwith. Beckwith yeah. Which is a boring book. I mean, unless <laughs> it is. Like the beginning of it where he works for the SAS is entertaining. And then the rest of the book is him fighting DC about the forming bureaucracy. the bureaucracy of, of trying to form yeah. a unit that they don't want formed. And then uh and then they ended on on a on the, the Iranian hostage situation. So I mean, good book. I wouldn't suggest it unless you're just a a, a special ops nerd like me. Uh, Rogue Heroes, though, it, it goes about Sterling, which is the founder of the SES, and his had a very similar um, fight that Beckwith had no, I believe to it. try to get the SES up and going. And they were and just like Beckwith and the Delta Force, which, you know, worlds apart. One was 1977 and one's like 42. They were built with, you know, with uh, a very specialty mission, but with spare parts and spare men like they weren't. They're not the SES that yeah. we know to now that we know today. Neither was the Delta Force in 1977. So it just goes through that process. And their first mission was a massive failure. So they were, they were really organized to go in Africa. Uh, the Germans had these air bases and, and they had air superiority and were just wrecking havoc on uh, the British um, military throughout Africa. So his answer to that was, give me, give me uh, a small group of men. We'll parachute within walking distance. I say within walk. 50 clicks within walking distance. <laughs> and then with a backpack of explosives, we'll sneak in in the middle of the night. And because planes are very lightweight, they're you know easy to, to blow up, honestly. Uh, we have a bunch of small charges and we'll put, you know, we can take out an entire fleet on the ground that they'll never be able to do through the air because their airplanes just all get shot down through air defense trying to make it mm -hmm. there. So they're like, it's that's a crazy idea. But, you know, if you think you can do it, quit bugging us. You're you know, annoying. You're Give annoying. Here you go. Yeah. You know, and here's a bunch of half decent men to do it. <laughs> and uh, his very first mission was a complete failure. They uh, it was a rainy night, a high wind night, a low loom night, everything uh, against them. But he wanted to do it so bad. He 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 pushed everybody out out the out the plane anyway. And. um I forget the percentages, but of the 40 guys that, that, that jumped out, I'm going to screw these numbers up real bad. That's right. I'm going to say it with confidence. Like I know it <laughs> Two end up making it to the, to the actual uh, airfield. Some of them died on landing with broken necks. Um, some of them were so injured that they had a plan that if you thought, if you were injured and couldn't make it to here, go the opposite way to this rendezvous point. Um, it was a massive disaster. I don't think they destroyed any, you know, those two guys that made it were like, oh, we're not a big enough force to really do anything. Jeez. Um, a massive failure. And he thought that they were going to disband him off of his massive failure. We'll come to find out they cared so little about his unit 
that they didn't care that he lost people <laughs> or that they, they didn't care. They didn't care. They didn't care enough to disband the unit. And so he, he continued on and eventually he started having some success. Anyway, that's amazing. It's a long yeah. story to say some of the things those British SAS guys did in that book, me as a Delta Force guy, I'm like, I'm not a man. Those, those, those are men. Like those yeah. are guys that saw that. I've, I've had some kind of bad days at work. Those guys had bad days yeah. at work. Just incredible stories of absolute heroes, rogue heroes. Yeah. Oh, great book. That's so interesting. I mean, we're getting ready for a trip to Europe. We're going to go to Normandy. We're going to check out Battle of the Bulge. Our kids are just old enough for they're really interested in that military history. And so we're rewatching Band of Brothers. Oh, you know, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I remember talking to uh, uh, Shrek, you know, John McPhee, and he was saying, like, look, I've been through Baghdad. I've been through these places, but I didn't run across those beaches in Normandy. You know, like, that's right. That's no next kidding. level. I have no idea what it takes to hear the 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 the, t- the tinging of bullets hitting your your uh, your your landing craft, your, your your maritime landing craft, and then open the doors to allow the bullets to now to start and then run across open terrain. That's right. For- it's just it's just insanity what, yeah. what those guys did. I was going to ask. So you mentioned when you're in that first mission, stronghold overnight, strong pointing. You've got an AC-130 overhead. It, it it makes me think back to if, if you look at Green Berets in Vietnam, I got to imagine like they were getting no rest that night. They had no, oh, no. AC-130 overhead. They're just <laughs> right. defending the perimeter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and you got no one to call, yeah. basically. Yeah. The um, gosh, it's just been so long. I wish there was a um, I wish I could remember some of the, Viet- the, the great Vietnam SF books that I read. Every one of them were were amazing. And if you really want to get into the history of, you know, the Mac V song. Yeah guys just guys doing amazing you know doing the the um the cross-border operations yep. or the snatch and grab operations uh along the um the uh um the coochie tunnel or the coochie trails yeah. just the ho chi minh trail and yeah. the, then the ho chi minh trails yeah. as well just just um, amazing feats of for instance some of our original halo operations happened in vietnam we lost Halo teams that inserted and never reported, never came back. And we have no idea what happened. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. That's, and, and today's and the military and the war that I know of, you know, in the last 20 years. And I and it's funny, I wanted to uh get out of the Q course so bad because I'm like, oh, we're gonna miss the war. Yeah. We're gonna miss the I war. Too. And yeah. uh little did I know my generation saw the most amount of war. And one ask, I don't, I'll tell you why I don't truly believe this, but time wise, yeah, the most amount of war in a, any generation of America has ever seen. And that's a true statement. I would also say, you know, five years, three years, two years of World War II was more war than I saw in, you know, in, in, in 17 years of war. Um, but, and that, and that, and I believe that statement. Uh, but anyway, I mean, l- let me yeah. say it the way I want to say it for this argument. And, uh, and you know, little did we know, like it was, um, we we weren't going to miss anything. Like it was, it was waiting no. on us. Boy, was it was it waiting on us. Um, but you just want to get in and, there, and you just want to get in there. And you had no idea at the time that yeah. Iraq was on the table. You know, that Iraq came up. Yeah. And at the end of my career, I had no idea Assyria came out of nowhere. You know, and ISIS came out of nowhere. Uh, and so to be able to, you know, put in several more trips into that AO at the end of my career, and just face a whole new enemy and face a whole new. Uh, Odd set of circumstance. Well, you know what? It's it's oddly different and it's oddly similar. Like yeah. every place I go, it's the same old, same old, with a little twist of of some, some nuances of what's different. What but, do you mean by that part? That it's the same old. The how would you describe that? War is war, and the enemy is the enemy. And although I haven't been there, um, feel free to flame me in the comments. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> You know, from what I've seen in Afghanistan, Iraq, and uh, Syria, I'm pretty sure if I could go back in time to Vietnam, I'd go on a patrol in Vietnam. And be like, you know what? This is a lot like being in Afghanistan. You know, and if, you know, if I went back for a little World War II, you know, we would do operations there, and I'd, you know, and I'd be like, you know what? This is a lot like, yeah. you know, you know, this part of war. There's so many similarities of war. Um, yet there's every war has its of, of the three wars I was a part of had its unique 
um, things that that were oddly specific yeah. to that war that you didn't see in other wars. Yeah, and, and the other in the other theaters. I feel like technology changes, and that is one of the big differences. My dad flew Hueys in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We talk about this all the time. I'd come back from our deployment. You like tell right. me about your night vision. Like tell me about your maps. Yeah, you know, so different how they fought there, but right. All the underlying aspects, the foundational aspects, right, are the same. Yes, yeah. I, um, one of my favorite books. I don't want to. I don't want to turn this into a, a book club. <laughs> but uh, one of my favorite books was Killing Patton. Bill O'Reilly did that, a Killing On series. Yeah. He's got a Killing On Lincoln. He's got one. a kill yeah. Killing Patton was a great book. And what I and I read it as a Delta Force guy with you know a lot of deployments in my belt. And one of his biggest complaints was Eisenhower, that he, he didn't was that he worked for, and the bureaucracy of the military, and how, if I could put words in you know in in Patton's mouth, he would probably would have used the term wokeness, and you know and uh, and his their sword I'm looking for their, their risk adversity yeah, risk risk aversion yeah yeah, for sure. yeah no I'm sorry yeah risk uh, aversion um uh, risk diversity that's that's <laughs> definitely a thing I've seen some you got yeah that. um I've seen a bunch different of different podcast. types of different risk podcasts. uh yeah their aversion to risk and, and I'm like we deal with that same yeah. thing these days yeah same thing that he's talking about we still we still deal with so that's what I mean. At the end of the day, a lot of things like change, yeah. but but the the core, you know, common basic things that you do in war and deal with, I'm I'm afraid have been going on for a long time. Yeah. So as you can, you can take it back to politics, George Washington was hated and hated doing the presidency job, and the newspapers of the day wrote nasty, nasty articles about him. George Washington. Yeah. Our, our, we put on a pedestal founding father. And we're like, oh, you know, politics these days is so controversial. It's been that way for it a has. long time. Yeah. You study just a little bit of politics and history and you see it's been It's been nasty really for a nasty. long time. Yeah. Um, look, as we wrap up this first round here, um, one of the things you mentioned before that I got to fact check you on is that you said you'd never seen an Apache miss a target and clearly they almost oh. killed you. <laughs> so I feel like well, there's some, hey, but I do hey. want to get some good Apache talk in here from a Delta operator before we wrap up round one. Uh, that's so you got me, you got me of sorts. Uh, I'm not saying that they get a hundred percent hit rate, never claimed a hundred percent. He put rounds on target. It's just unfortunate. He put a water few, went a little high, uh, uh -huh. but yeah, he 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 affected his target. I'll, I'll, he still he still did that. But you did have some good experiences with Apaches. I had great experiences with Apaches. I loved it when Apaches showed up. Uh, I had Apaches support me in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and every every you know not not every single operation, but um, I've had you know Apache support at at some level um, in all three uh, combat theaters and. Um, I can think of two times we got into a pretty nasty tick and on the way home, uh, one time we were escorted by an A-10 and, uh, just doing laps around us and all that's, all that was great. I'll be honest with you. It's still a fast mover and yeah. you don't feel like if at the end of the day, like if he, if you need him and he misses, you know, he doesn't see it. He has to circle all the way it's around. It's a long reattack. Yeah, yeah. It's a long reattack. And when you have, you know, a pair of. A pair of Apache, uh, a pair of uh, Apaches following your convoy back home to make sure you don't you don't get messed up again. You know that if they wanted to, they'll just sit there and hover and engage this thing as long as they want and and just annihilate it before they move on to the next thing. Love I loved having Apaches <laughs> follow me around. You were not paid to say this. We just like uh, like giving it some airtime when we can. <laughs> um, so we'll wrap round one here. We'll uh, we'll pause for a bit. We'll come back and record round two, but. For folks listening, um, we'll get more into First Responder Coffee Company on this next round, but we've got some here. We have tried it. We'll have that in a separate uh, separate video for people to see um, with some outtakes, but definitely get your hands <laughs> on the bourbon blend. Highly recommend that from FRCC. I'm sure they have going, how do you have an outtake of coffee? Yeah. Well, uh, challenge accepted. Get ready. Challenge accepted.
Hope you all enjoyed that combat story. It's not often that we get to have a uh, tier one operator, especially not one like Brent. It's very cool to see him taking a lot of what he learned from an organizational and leadership standpoint and applying that in, in the coffee and cigar domains. Uh, clearly uh, very successful just one year into the business. Um, with that, I thought I'd pick a few comments from our recent interview with another pretty elite operator, Mike Edwards. So we've got a few here. Uh, one on YouTube was from JROS4YU. He says, I remember Staff Sergeant Edwards as my cadre and RIP, and he was indeed terrifying, LOL. If you listened to this episode uh, with Mike and did not see him on the show, it's worth taking a look. I'm almost embarrassed to be sitting across the table from him. The guy's got biceps as big as my my, my head. Um, so that's where that's coming from. He's a big dude, and I'm sure when he was running a rip, it was not a fun person to be around. We had another comment uh, from Rusty8284, and he says, Hey, I'm from England, I'm making my way through all of your videos. First time to comment, but I make sure that I do like every video I've watched so far. Amazing to listen to you both talk through everything so fluently. Merry Christmas to you and your family from Mike. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, taking the time not just to listen, but leave those likes. Helps us get this out to more people, uh, even across the pond. And with that, we do have our uh, Combat Story newsletter. You can find it at combatstory.com slash newsletter. It's got a little bit of what we're doing each week. It's got a joke that we crack on some other branch of the military. It also goes back to this week in history and looks at something important that took place in either military or intel history that I think people like us tend to find interesting. It's just once a week we kick it out. I think you'll enjoy it. And with that, thank you for listening this long. Really appreciate it and stay safe.